Um, roll A, take A. Hello, and thank you for joining us for this special half-hour edition of the News Feed. I'm Kelsey O'Donnell. And I'm Lauren Skinker. For the next 30 minutes, we will bring you stories making headlines at Virginia Tech and in the New River Valley. In the first half of our newscast, we will look specifically at the stories related to Virginia Tech campus and the community. And later in the show, we will turn our attention to news around the New River Valley area. But first, Virginia Tech headlines. Not unlike most colleges and universities in the U.S., Virginia Tech faces issues such as crime, racism, and sexual assault among its student population. As a result, some students become unhappy with how such issues are addressed by the universities and call for a change in a public way. One such case happened recently, sparked by a tweet expressed, expressing grievances with the Title IX process. A Virginia Tech student asked peers to quote his tweet and share a time they realized VT was not home. It was an effort to prove a point that turned into an organized class walkout in support of sexual assault survivors. We get countless, countless emails throughout the week, throughout the year, throughout the semester about just sexual assault, sexual assault, sexual assault. But like, I think it's like simply it has just been an email, you know? We're like, oh, it's another like tragedy that's happening. But the walk actually brings light to how seriously serious it is. During the walkout, partici participants chanted, Title IX excuses crime. Students and those supporting them want to see a change in how sexual assault policy is enforced. Virginia Tech has over 32,000 students, making it the largest university in the Commonwealth of Virginia. The university attracts students from all around the world by pushing the narrative of diversity. But what are these students, specifically Asian Americans, experiencing? Although Virginia Tech is a predominantly white institution, Asians are the second largest race group in the university. A portion of this group are Asian Americans, students with Asian descent born and raised in America. Many of these students wrestle with identity, whether to embrace more of their Asian side or American side. Asian organizations across campus have allowed Asian Americans to simply be who they are. President of the Vietnamese Student Association, Melanie Doe, shares about her experience as an Asian American. Even though I was I'm Asian American, it never set me back from like having leadership experiences or like making the most out of my experience here at Virginia Tech. And I just took advantage of all the things that I, all the opportunities that came around, and, and it never really got discriminated against, which was really nice. YouTuber and entertainer Timothy De La Ghetto spoke last week at Virginia Tech about his Asian American experience. The YouTuber shared with the Asian American students how to fully live out both heritages. He states to embrace where you come from and to be proud of who you are, and that identity stems from the inside rather than the out. As the saying goes, life is 20% what happens to you and 80% how you respond to it. And that is no different when talking about the tragedy that happened at Virginia Tech on April 16, 2007. As awful as that day was, there is an organization on campus dedicated to research on how humans overcome these horrible events. News Eve reporter Chris Finch joins us here at the news desk. For, to tell us more. Chris? Thanks, guys. The Center for Peace Studies and Violence Prevention was founded on campus as a response to the April 16, 2007 tragedies. Outside of planning the April 16th events, the office is mainly a research institution on how community comes together to triumph over tragedy. Director of the center, James Hawden, let me into the center and gave me a tour. April 16, 2007, Virginia Tech student Sung Kui Cho strutted into Norris Hall, locked the doors, ascended the staircase to the second floor, and opened fire into classroom after classroom. This tragedy still rings in the hearts of Virginia Tech today. However, in the midst of tragedy, a university office came about to try to prevent these tragedies from ever happening again. This office is called the Office of Peace Studies and Violence Prevention and rests at ground zero of where the shootings occurred. That isn't all that they do, though. Director of the office, James Howden, also notes that it's important to observe how communities respond to these kinds of tragedies. When uh, the tragedy here happened, and really the f next day, and, and seeing the community's response, uh, we 
there's lots of anecdotal evidence about how communities come together in the solidarity outpouring of, of solidarity that occurs after these types of events. Other than planning events in remembrance for the April 16th shooting, Director Howden does several research projects that diagnose what causes tragedy. Student aide in Villa Vicencio shares what he thinks is the key to violence prevention. Because I feel like sometimes when people do things in terms of violence, it's because they feel somewhere deep in their heart that they're not loved. I feel like that's a very dark place to be and it's a very sad thing for someone to not feel loved. And I think that's why I kind of want to spread spread that love to others. Students can take comfort in centers like these to take care of issues that politicians are unable to. Director Hawden also wanted me to add that this community's response to tragedy is one of the greatest that he has ever been around. Guys, we're lucky to be Hokies. Absolutely. Thanks, Chris. And other news for international students, adjusting to life in a new country can be difficult. Getting involved with organizations on campus can make the move much easier, and Virginia Tech has no shortage of clubs and organizations to choose from. Some of these exchange students join, choose to join Greek life for their short times in the States. Even if they are only in the country for one semester, Greek organizations have made it possible for them to get involved for their time here. Baptiste Manchicourt, a French exchange student, shares his thoughts on American Greek life. The Greek life. You know, because we see that in movies in France, and it's like the American dream for us. So I just just wanted to experience it by my own, and uh, yeah, people seems to be very nice. Greek life can give international students the opportunity to make friends and connections that will last for years to come. There are countless opportunities for students to get involved at a four-year university like Virginia Tech. A common route that students take to find their people is by joining a fraternity and sorority. However, not all of these Greek life communities are understood. Newsfeed reporter Justice Smith tells us more in this next story. A growing number of black students at Virginia Tech are finding their niche in another form of Greek life, black Greek life otherwise known as National Panhellenic Council, usually found on the campus of an HBCU, many Hokies of color are finding that these are spaces where they can call home. Gabrielle Lozama, member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated at Virginia Tech, sat with me to share some of its unique experiences that make Black Greek life yet another facet of Black excellence. Like we have calls and signs, like AKA we have a skiwi, and that's how we um, call to each other at like a distance or even um, in like a large setting. And then we have our pinkies, um, usually do that in uh, pictures and things like that. And then we have ivies, um, they that's our flower that represents our organization and we make them with our hands. It's taught me how to be my best self. Yes, I'm Gabby and I'm a college student, but now I'm Gabby, the college student who is also an AKA and representing a larger national organization. Haley Mingram, Assistant Director of Fraternity and Sorority Life at Virginia Tech, breaks down why it's vital for the Hokie community to have a presence of Black Greek life. So a lot of students that I talk to don't feel included in the narrative at Virginia Tech. But I think my hope is that they feel included, they, they matter. While this may not be a space that was created for us, we're going to make sure we create spaces for us. Whether or not MPHC Greek Life ever has a physical space on the campus of Virginia Tech, like their IFC counterparts, they will continue to wear their letters with pride as they expand upon future recruitments. This has been Justice Smith reporting for the newsfeed. Stay with us. There's more just ahead on this special edition of the newsfeed. A road project could change traffic flow and increase safety around Virginia Tech campus in a big way. We'll tell you more about it. Plus, a look how Virginia Tech is introducing a new dining hall experience for students simply with the wave of a hand. That story and more after this break. Hey, Dad, I need your help asking Jessica to prom. Of course. Love is like the ocean. You have to tread the Oh, waters. Dad, that's not the kind of help I needed. Hey, Jessica. I, um, will you go to prom with me? Yes. <laughs> you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care can't wait to share their first with you. Welcome back to the newsfeed. Students and faculty are used to construction around the Virginia Tech campus. 
and it can be frustrating at times. But there's one construction plan they may be pleased with that will ease how they get around campus. Newsfeed reporter Logan Ross has more. Virginia Tech and VDOT have reported they are in the works of creating a $63 million perimeter road on the west side of Virginia Tech's campus. VDOT and Virginia Tech plan to develop a two-lane divided road that will run for 2.61 miles and will connect Price's Fork Road and Southgate Drive. Spokesman for Virginia Tech Mark Ozowski gave me a little insight about this project. And it's a road that will help us as Virginia Tech grows in size, as buildings are built, as our student population grows, we need the ability to get around campus. I am currently standing where some of this construction is going to be taking place. While many Blacksburg residents are excited about these new traffic patterns, many students are feeling differently. Honestly, it causes a lot of inconveniences around campus. I know in the long run it's going to help, but the construction when driving around campus, it you have to like stop a lot and everything and when I have my car on campus it's hard for me to get around places quickly. Virginia Tech and VDOT are still waiting for the funding and do not intend for this project to begin for another couple years. Since Virginia Tech is a state school, these roads are owned by the state and nothing can be done until VDOT has the money to start. Reporting for the news feed, I'm Logan Ross. It's probably safe to say that every Virginia Tech student has walked across the drill field at the center of campus at least once. And they've likely seen the segments of pathways, pathway materials located near the War Memorial Hall where the Facilities Department has been working on the Drill Field Pathways Project. The project began in 2015, yet no changeable, noticeable changes have been see made since. As newsfeed reporter Abby Dunn tells us, students are wondering when or if the project will be completed. Back in August of 2015, 14 different materials were installed on a portion of the drill field by the Virginia Tech Facilities Department. Over the 2015-2016 academic year, students were encouraged to take a survey on which pathway material they liked the best. Meanwhile, the Facilities Department monitored the materials, durability, and performance throughout the wide variety of weather conditions the campus experiences throughout the year. However, as of spring 2019, no changes have been made and the seniors who were here to participate in the survey are wondering if anything is ever going to happen with the project. Jack Washington, Program Coordinator for the University Planning and Architecture Department, explains what's happening now. And then so since then, part of the process involved a faculty research team focused on the smart field sort of um, technology. Basically, it captures energy at certain points on the drill field, or that's the intent at least. Um, of people walking so that it can be redirected into lighting. With the different portions of the project awaiting funding and more research, the drill field is still without improvement. Engineer Nikki Cranus explains her opinion on the pathway's current condition. I definitely feel like they could be rerouted in a way where they could make new paths where people have already like created one because there's definitely a couple cut throughs that they haven't paved yet. As of now, the Facilities Department is hoping to add on the smart field technology and improve accessibility, so a final say as to when these changes will actually take place is still unknown. Reporting for the News Feed, I'm Abby Dunn. News technology is always growing and expanding at Virginia Tech, and the dining halls are no exception to this type of change. Now the dining hall D2 has some new technology that is going to make getting your food a quicker and easier process. Technology is beginning to update as D2 has just implemented their new biometrics program called MorphoWave. With this new software, all you have to do is swipe your hand and your meal is paid for. Not only is this system more efficient, but it also is safer. Kelvin Bergsten, the assistant director of D2 and DX Express, described the security benefits it provides. To protect our guests, you know, not, you know, somebody can walk in and, and if they're not checking the IDs properly, somebody could use somebody else's card. This new scanner will reduce the amount of foot traffic at the front of D2 and will do away with swiping your Hokie passport since a fast track lane is provided for with, Mor with MorphoWave. A special group of students called Hokie Ambassadors dedicate their time to showing off Virginia Tech leading tours all around campus. In this next story, News 3 reporter Ella Teston tells us more about these student volunteers do to impress prospective students and their families. Springtime is one of the busiest times of the year for Hokie Ambassadors. Not only are they in the middle of their recruitment process, they're also juggling an overwhelming amount of tours. 
Sam Miller, executive board member of Hokie Ambassadors, is here to tell us more. As a Hokie Ambassador, we're the tour guides on campus. So we walk backwards, we're those people that you see randomly walking backwards throughout campus with a group of 15 to 20 uh, random pa like parents and students. And we just explain Virginia Tech, um, how we're trained to. So we have a 26 page fact packet that we study with all these different miscellaneous facts about Virginia Tech, as well as adding a little bit of personal experience, talking about what it means to be a tour guide and what it means to be a Virginia Tech student through our own eyes. And I think that's what makes it so special and makes Virginia Tech tours so influential to students going and looking at colleges. Hokie Ambassadors are a tight-knit group of enthusiastic individuals who dedicate their time to prospective new Hokies. Julia Nidgen, Director of Recruitment and Executive Board Member of Hokie Ambassadors, explains in more detail. I am the Director of Recruitment, so I'm in charge of recruiting um, the Hokie, next Hokie Ambassadors for the upcoming year, and this year was awesome just because we had the opportunity of bringing on the largest class, and so we brought on 90 people, um, and we usually bring on around 60. For more information about Hokie Ambassadors, please contact ambassadors at vt.edu. This is Ella Teston reporting for the Newsfeed. Well, that wraps up our look at some of the stories making news in the tech community. Stick around, there's more ahead. Coming up, a look at some stories in the New River Valley. Our Newsfeed cohorts James Ahn and Logan Ross are standing by in the newsroom, and they will take you through the second half of this newscast. James and Logan. Thanks, Kelsey and Lauren. That's right, we'll be switching gears, turning our focus to the New River Valley. Yes, and some of the stories just ahead are an update on plans for the old Blacksburg Middle School site and what local organizations are doing to continue the fight against food insecurity in our area. Stay with us. We'll be back after this short break. I'll be right back. Hi. You think you're probably sober? Yeah. But you're thinking about taking the back roads home, just in case. If you're probably sober, then why would you do that? Good choice. Probably okay isn't okay. If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. That's a full glass of wine. I'll be chatting you later. Um, roll A, take A. Hello and welcome back to the second half of this special half hour edition of the Newsfeed. I'm James Ahn. And I'm Logan Ross. In the first half of our newscast, we looked, over, we looked at Virginia Tech stories that are making headlines. And now we turn our attention to the news around the New River Valley area. An ongoing development in Blacksburg in recent years has been the revitalization of downtown through the old Blacksburg Middle School project. A company called Midtown Development is working on developing a multi-purpose community for residential and business spaces on the ground of the old Blacksburg Middle School. The Midtown Development needs the property to be rezoned in order to begin the construction of this multi-purpose community. Blacksburg's town council met in late April to discuss recent changes to the company's rezoning application. Some of these changes included building materials, building design, and parking. This process is not complete yet and could certainly take longer than expected to complete. Current issues that need to be sorted out are the exact design models of the buildings that Midtown Development intends on constructing as well as whether to create additional parking spaces in the proposed parking garage. With the recent announcement of Mishmish closing in downtown Blacksburg, many students and community members are left with questions and concerns. Specifically, what will be filling in the place of the shop? Established in 1970, Mishmish has been the only store to tailor to major specific needs such as the architecture and art departments at Virginia Tech. The town of Blacksburg has no plans at the moment of who will be filling the location. However, the owners are actively seeking potential store owners with the architectural trend in mind. Vice Mayor of Blacksburg, Susan Anderson, shared her thoughts on the future of the location. Downtown Blacksburg is a great place, I think, to open any business, and particularly in that area right now. We have a wonderful women's clothing store in the same block. Uh, we have the uh, Sugar Magnolia right across the street ice cream. So uh, there's a lot of things to pull you into the downtown besides our restaurant and our, and our pizzerias and our bars. So I think it would be good for just about any retail. 
future of the lot is still unknown. However, Anderson hinted at the opening of a new retail shop in its place. Located on busy Main Street, FOMO Cafe is one of the many places to grab a coffee, crepe, or some ice cream in Blacksburg. But what sets this cafe apart? Their devotion to giving back to the community. Newsfeed reporter Maddie Eyed gives us an update on the cafe since it opened a year ago. Brothers El Medi and Youssef Ranim opened FOMO Cafe in March of 2018 as a way to give back to the Blacksburg community. Their business plan included donating anywhere from 7 to 10 percent of their profits to charities and other local organizations in need. One year after opening, the brothers say FOMO has not yet reached the local impact they are striving for. It takes a while to make an impact. It takes a good amount of time to make an impact. And the bigger you grow, the more of an impact you can make. So, you know, right now, our impact is very minimal. Our impact is with whatever, you know, causes that need donations or that want to do certain uh, profit nights. While the Ranim brothers might not be satisfied with their impact yet, customers are taking notice. It is really important to me that a company cares, and I love that FOMO gives some of its profits back to um, local charities. FOMO donates to the Blacksburg Interfaith Food Pantry each month and the profits from their six varieties of chai teas are donated to saving endangered species around the world. The brothers are in works now to open their second restaurant right down the street from FOMO Cafe that will feature burgers, tacos, and specialty milkshakes. This new restaurant will have the same business plan of donating a small percentage of their profits to local charities. Surely this is not the last that we will see of these charitable brothers. Reporting from Blacksburg, this is Maddie Eyed. Blacksburg in the New River Valley is no stranger to food insecurity. Despite the variety of food establishments on Main Street and on campus, people still face hunger every day. Newsfeed reporter Ryan Niblock tells us more about organizations fighting this growing issue. Despite Blamers of Virginia Tech's top ranked food, there's a large percentage of students and locals that face food insecurity on a daily basis. It's organizations like Interfaith Food Pantry they make sure the quarter of the community has food on the table. Blacksburg Interfaith Food Pantry has been around for 31 years now. Through donations from supermarkets like Kroger, Food Lion, students, schools, and individuals all donating time and money, they're able to feed 600 individuals per month. That is 150 families not going hungry this month. Vern Simpson has been the director of the Interfaith Food Pantry for the last 14 years, looking to make a difference for local families who qualify for the food pantry. And it's a full-time job just just to keep the uh, level of food going that we do now. Um, every week, almost two tons of food go out the front door here with people. But we're happy to feed more people if, if they come in from Blacksburg. It's students like Virginia Tech sophomore Emily Warwick, who as an ACC student delegate brought the topic of food insecurity to the national level. It's like we divert so much food. Um, I'd say more than the average school. We divert that food through Campus Kitchen, but all of it goes into the community and all of it goes, let's say, half an hour away from here when none of it is diverted back into the students that are paying for it who may need that extra support. It's clear, the community we have in Blacksburg, that people will always find a way to make a difference. Reporting for the news feed, this is Ryan Niblock. Stay with us. There's more ahead. As another school year ends and the summer break begins, we'll show what a local organization is doing to help kids avoid the summer slide. Plus, the month of May is National Burger Month, so where are some of the best burgers in the New River Valley? We'll find out. There was an old woman who lived in a shoe. She had so many children, she didn't know what to do. She gave them some broth without any bread and kissed them all soundly Lights out. Good night. and put them to bed. Hunger is a story we can end. End it at feedingamerica.org. Welcome back to the news feed. As the school season wraps up and the kids start to get ready and excited for summer break, a big issue still remains. Will kids be able to retain all the information over the summer months in order to be ready for the next school year? Community Housing Partners in Christiansburg is running a book drive in order to help keep the younger residents and then combat the summer slide. 
Newsfeed reporter Trey Lyle has more in the next story. Did you know the average student loses about a month of academic learning during the summer slide? Community Housing Partners, a Carstenberg-based nonprofit, is working to offset that loss through CHP Reads, summer reading program. This is our first year doing uh, the book drive. It's called CHP Reads, summer reading program. And we have a lot of youth residents at our properties who might not have access to books or might not have access to things like summer camps. Goal is to help youth combat the summer slide which is a term used to describe the academic regression experienced by students over the summer. Summer slide is just the concept that what children learn during the academic year gets lost over the summer months when they don't have access to the academic stimulation and learning. And then it puts them at a deficit in August when they should come in at grade level. They've lost a lot over the summer months. Now, until Friday, May 10th, CHP is collecting books for the youth that live in their communities across the area. It's definitely that we hope that our kids are ready for school, but we also hope that they are excited about it. Um, like I said, there's a chance and tendency for our kids to disengage over the summer months because they don't have the daily interaction with teachers and with classmates, and we want to keep them involved. They're also trying to partner with volunteer, civic, and faith-based organizations in the community to collect books and donate them. They are collecting books for all grade levels. You can turn them in in their home office in Christiansburg and the Energy Solutions Research and Training Center. Also, they accept monetary donations on their website. For the News Feed, I'm Trey Lyle. There has been a record number of measles cases this year. Less and less children are being vaccinated against deadly diseases causing a rise in illness. How can the NRV stay protected? In the U.S., some parents are choosing not to vaccinate their children. This is causing outbreaks of diseases that were previously eradicated. Measles has been a particularly popular disease unvaccinated children are contracting. Though Southwest Virginia has not yet been affected by a measles outbreak, are parents properly protecting their children? The pros and cons, um, discuss what the risks, the benefits, potential side effects are. In fact, each vaccine has its own vaccine information statement. The problem is if um, there are a few sporadic people who don't get immunized and that vaccine preventable disease um, comes through the area, that those unimmunized individuals can get ill with that illness and then pass it along to others. Parents in the New River Valley are encouraged to vaccinate their children. Parents can talk to their local pediatrician for more information about how to protect their children. The month of May celebrates National Burger Month, giving the people of the New River Valley a chance to celebrate their favorite meal. But what goes into a good burger and where can someone go to get these high quality burgers? Newsfeed reporter Ryan Wilson tells us. A not well known fact about the month of May is that the U.S. celebrates National Burger Month. Burgers of all shapes and sizes are served in the New River Valley and is a popular meal, especially among Virginia Tech students. Junior James Kelly knows what he looks for no, when it comes to a good I'm burger. Yeah. Uh, a patty, and then you've got to have cheese. Um, then you've got to have like something, something under, like pickles or something. And then on top of the burger and the cheese, you have like lettuce, tomato, maybe some onions. James knows the other restaurants that serve better and quality burgers. Pittsburgh Tap Taphouse House has good burgers, and um, I haven't had them, but my roommates have had them. Uh, Hokey House apparently has really good burgers, too. James is right. There are plenty of upscale places in the New River Valley area that serve quality burgers. One of those is Bull and Bones. They are known for their diversity and high quality of burgers. I took to Bull and Bones here on South Main Street to find out what kinds of burgers they offer to their customers. Um, the smoke alarm. It's always been kind of one of my favorites. Uh, jalapeno ranch, jalapenos, lettuce, tomato, onion. He also knows what goes into a good high quality burger. How it's cooked and what seasoning is included are major factors in making a quality burger. We're actually using a wood fired grill. Every morning we load wood into the bottom of it um, just to give it that smoky flavor. Yes, it, it does have, it is a gas powered, but at the same time we are incorporating wood in, into cooking not only our burgers, but also our steaks. Reporting for the news feed, this is Ryan Wilson. That will wrap up this special edition of the news feed, a look at stories making headlines in the New River Valley and at Virginia Tech. The news feed will be going on a hiatus for a few months, but we'll be returning in the fall with a new group of journalists and a new batch of stories to keep you up to date about what's going on with Virginia Tech and the New River Valley area. While we're away, if you have a story idea, send us an email at newsfeednrv at gmail.com and you can connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. 
Thanks for joining us. I'm Logan Ross. And I'm James Ahn. For all of us at the Newsfeed, we hope you enjoy the rest of spring and have a wonderful summer. Go Hokies!